Kane, interview with Mr. Lawrence uh, Steubing, 27 February uh, 2001, Freeport Armory, Long Island. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hasselm. Videographer is Mr. Michael Aiken. Uh Mr. Steubing, tell me about where you were born and raised. I was born in Ozone Park, Queens. I was raised there, and uh, also we had a home up in Popo Junction, New York. And uh, I spent very little time in the city as far as summer vacations and weekends. We would travel up there. Kept me busy in the summertime working on farms for a dollar a day. Enjoyed that life. And you graduated from Ozone Park High School? No, I graduated from Woodrow Wilson Vocational High School. Uh, at that time, uh, I wanted to go into aviation uh, mechanics and took that up and ended up uh, actually making little wooden model airplanes for the government so that they could use them as uh, observers. To, uh, they show this model, a silhouette, mm -hmm. and people could name it as a, a German or whatever type of airplanes. Well, where was that? Where were you making the models? In high school. Really? <laughs> Ended up making these models for the government. And that was after Pearl Harbor? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and then so my aviation mechanical training went out the window. <laughs> Made wooden models. <laughs> what, did the government give you a kit or did you build them from scratch? Uh, we built them from scratch. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, I guess the government supplied uh, all the uh, the outlines and everything else, and they had to be done to specs so that, yes, they could take this, and from what I understood, they take these models and they were painted just black. Mm -hmm. And they would uh, display them someplace uh, uh, for the military, and they'd say it's a P-51 to know the difference between ours and possibly the uh, the German Messerschmitt or the Jap Zeros, and all different ones. Big ones, small ones. It was quite a program. Mm. So what did you do after high school, and how did you come to be in the service? Well, when I was 17, I enlisted in the Army. <laughs> I was sworn in in a whole big room full of us in New York. And uh, when I was enlisted, they gave you a different colored tag than the other people that were drafted. And you went to the front of the line. You didn't have to stand and wait. So we'd be drawn up and right in to be examined. And uh, uh, when it was over, we went downstairs. And uh, there were three desks, I believe it was. Uh, the Army, Navy, and Marines. The Air Force at that time was part of the Army. And you had your choice to go. And I selected the Army. My father was uh, at Camp Shanks at the time, and uh, he had given me two letters of recommendation for the Air Force from colonels or whatever, and I kept them in my pocket and I enlisted in the Army. Hmm. Why did you choose the Army? I don't know. I didn't want to fly. I didn't boats I couldn't take to the sea, so I just thought, yeah, the Army, I thought that's for me. And we went into this room and was sworn in. And whoever the officer was, he called out two names, mine and one other. And he said, uh, the rest of you go out that door, you two stay. And we stayed. And when he was all done, I'll never forget what he said. He said, you, you two are too young. You go home. We will notify you when to where to report, when to come in. And he said, but remember this, you're in the Army. <laughs> and we were sent home. And then uh, that was February 10th, 1944, I guess, yeah. And uh, that's a, a date that my brother-in-law enlisted, or was drafted into the service in 40... 42, 
My father went into the service in 43 on February 10th, and I went in the service on February 10th. So the three of us. My father was a, uh, a civilian advisor at Camp Shanks, New York. I guess he had a, uh, an assimilated rank of a lieutenant colonel, something like that. What did he do up at Camp Shanks? Uh, he was in the automobile business, and uh, at that place, uh, that was a port of embarkation, and the vehicles had to be set up before they went overseas, I guess, drained of gasoline or whatever, but they had to be in perfect running condition, put in the gas and start the vehicle. And uh, that was one of his functions for the, for the Army, to see that the vehicles were... Uh, Did you ever visit him up there? Oh, yes, once. And I said to him, never again. I visited him once when I got uh, out of basic training. My father lived in uh, officers' quarters. And I went to mess with him and where he was quartered, but all I did was salute. I saluted a hundred times. <laughs> and I said, that's it. Next time, Pop, you come see me. <laughs> was it a big post? Uh, Shanks was, yes. Yes, Camp Shanks was. A, it was uh, just over the Tappan Zee Bridge up in that area. Basically all uh, wooden barracks type construction? Yes, yes, as well as I remember, yeah, steps going up. Yeah. Well, let's come back now. You were sent home because you were um, underage or too young. Yes. What did you do while you were waiting around to go into the service? I mean, waiting to be called up. Okay, I worked on Pier 54 North River for the Canard White Star Line. Uh, I was uh, in the the gear room, as they called it, uh, for the ships that were going overseas, the turnbuckles, the ropes, and that had to be uh, freed up uh, so that they could use it over again. And uh, I worked down with the, all the stevedores and longshoremen, but I was part of Canard White Star Line. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I used to wear an old set of my brother-in-law's fatigues the one-piece outfit, and whenever I was on the pier, he, all the insignias were off, but you could see where the sergeant stripes were and the likes of that, and they used to used to think that I was a, a kid that was in the service and out already, <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> it made me feel very big. But I did that until I received uh, my notice to report on June 1st. Mm -hmm. um, went to Fort Dix. Uh, that was it. What happened in Fort Dix? In Fort Dix, uh, well, as I say in the book, I learned what a sergeant was. You know, he, uh, <laughs> they had an awful lot of them, and he was the, the one boss you had to worry about. Uh, weren't they, didn't stay there very long. From there, we went on a train, uh, we headed west. And I thought, well, everybody, uh, like all the stories that are told, uh, uh, all the rumors flying, we're going to Japan. Until we got as far as Illinois, I guess, and then we made a sharp left turn and started down. And uh, we all felt very happy about that because we figured, well, we're not going to the West Coast. So I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, uh, for basic training. Uh, what was basic like? Pardon? What was basic at Fort McClellan like? Uh, it wasn't really hard. I, I, I enjoyed the service 100%. I always thought I should have never come out. Uh, discipline was something I had at home and it wasn't hard to take in the service. So, uh, uh, and again, as uh, later in life, the mayor in uh, Vivias, Belgium, said to, to me at a reception that, uh, you know, what was it like in the service? And I said, well, at 18 years old, everything is fun and games. It really is. Between 18 and 20 years, I think he is the best soldier in the world because he feels he's invincible. Nothing. So 
basic training was, uh, you know, nothing more than discipline. There were guys you didn't like. But today, uh, Sergeant Wilnowski, if I ever saw him, I'd shake his hand and say, thank you. Because he was one miserable man, but right. And, uh, you know, many times that's what saves your life, I guess. You know, that if somebody says duck, you don't ask why. You just duck. So, uh, uh, it was somewhat of a challenge, but I, I never minded. How did you, well, bring us to the point where you got overseas. I'm sorry? Tell, tell us about how you got overseas. Okay, from uh, Fort McClellan, uh, I traveled up to, uh, actually, Port of Embarkation was uh, Miles Standish in Boston. And uh, we left Boston on December, whatever, uh, December 9th or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we were on a very large luxury liner, not part of a convoy or anything else. We just took off uh, one or two days out. The destroyers that were with us left us, and we went across to on our own until two corvettes, the British destroyers, met us uh, as we got close to Europe to escort us in. But it was funny because uh, that ship that I went to Europe on was mm -hmm. uh, the same ship my mother-in-law, who I didn't know at the time, went back to Ireland on before the war. So <laughs> we were both on the same ship for two different reasons. Uh, landed in uh, in England. We spent uh, just a couple of days there, I guess. Was at that time uh, maybe things weren't going so good. We didn't really didn't know it uh, what was going on in Europe, and we were we were rushed. I was one of those replacements that went into an outfit that was uh, pretty well torn up in the in the Ardennes and uh, very few officers, very few men. You know, it was just uh, a bad thing. And we were up in this town of Dohain when I went with the 5th Armored, or am I getting ahead of no, myself? No, go ahead. Uh, uh, as replacements that we were, those few that were in the outfit prior to that, that were old timers, you really weren't accepted. They, they didn't want to know you too well because I guess after a while when you found out why, it made sense. They didn't want to know you because they figured, hey, you're a green kid, you're going to get your behind shot off tomorrow and that's it. I don't want to get to know too much about you. Uh, the squad that I was in and the platoon was mostly replacements, so we were band together. I was with two, two fellows, Schofield and Tony Rich, through basic training, and we both ended up in the same squad of infantry in the 5th Armored Division. So, uh, there were many things in basic training uh, that when you were taught, the first thing that when we hit the outfit, we were met by a, uh, a medical officer. And he said to us, he said, uh, whatever you were taught back in the States in basic training about how to take care of a wound, he says, forget it. He said, I would, if you get hit, he says, I don't care what you do, but stop the bleeding. Stuff a dirty sock in it. He says, I would rather treat an infected wound on a live soldier than a clean wound on one that bled to death. <laughs> it really stuck. Mm -hmm. Take a dirty sock and stuff it in there. Uh, it was cold, uh, there was a lot of snow, and uh, we were more or less being trained into the outfit uh, with the tank crew and uh, of course the armored infantry when we were out of action we were separated 
the infantry and the tanks went another place. When you married up, that was a tank and a half track. You were married to the same tank crew. So even though we were separated when we would pull back, uh, you got to know these people and uh, that's what we were being introduced into. Uh, this, uh, as I say, it was very cold and uh, one day uh, this little boy, this 14-year-old kid comes up and asks for food. We didn't have anything, but we got a sock of wet coffee from where the mess was, and we gave the kid this, and he walked away with this bag of wet coffee. Next day, his father came up with him, and we were bivouacked in an area, and uh, we thought, what did we do to this little man coming with this kid? He invited us in for a meal in the home, which was just outside the bivouac area, and we went. And we were served, we snuck out actually, we couldn't walk out. We were served rabbit and very, very small potatoes in the dining room. Now, to us, what did we know? Again, we were 18 years old. We were probably eating what that family had to eat for a week. And there's three GI sitting there eating. And in the dining room, that was something that you never did unless in Europe, unless you're really company. So, uh, that boy was Paul, he was 14 years old, and as I said, 36 years later, my wife and I took me four months with the Belgium Embassy in Washington to locate that family. But we did locate him, and uh, I went back spent some time with him in his home. But uh, that's another big two books that I have on that experience. It was great. Uh, after Dohain, we went up into Holland. Uh, became actually part of, under Montgomery, we were part of a, oh, the U.S. Army that was under Montgomery and Eisenhower, as I read later on, told Montgomery to take very good care of us because the American people wouldn't like too much to happen <laughs> because of somebody's blunder. But uh, we went up through where the gliders came in and the, the troops, the paratroops, and I guess that was the story of a bridge too far or whatever. But we were amazed at the gliders that were in the trees and demolished, and that's the area. We were in and out of the, the British area, up through, uh, through there. Uh, actually, as I say to people that ask, uh, I really don't know where I was or what time it was or what day it was. You lose all sense of time. and. Uh, I often say the Germans didn't know how to react to us because we were lost. We didn't know where we were. We didn't, they'd say, are they behind us, in front of us, around us? But uh, we did the Rhineland, Central, uh, Ruhr River. You know, uh, we moved. We were, moved very fast. And, uh, uh, Battles that we had, uh, again, don't remember too much. Uh, I think maybe you, uh, you don't want to remember too much. The first time I ever went in was uh, when we went across the field and it was just when all the snow was melting. We came to a, a railroad in front of us. The only thing is the railroad was up maybe eight, ten feet at least, uh, the embankment on the side of it. Uh, we were out of the, the half tracks, we were with the, the tanks, but the tanks couldn't get up it. They were being stuck in the mud and everything, so we had to go over the tracks on our own, just plain old foot infantry at that point. <laughs> we don't want to do that. We wanted to wait for the tanks. 
and they had to get tank retrievers in, the likes of that. And, uh, we would bypass many towns. Uh, if there was something there, we'd encircle it, go out through the fields around it, and uh, that became, uh, I guess, for the troops, the Germans that were in the town, to say, hey, they're all around us, they're behind us, in front of us, and they would, uh, foot infantry, the infantry divisions that were part of uh, uh, our combat command, uh, made it a little easier for them, if you can say easy, it really wasn't. But at least the, the soldiers of the German that was there would give up a little bit easier knowing that they, they just went through us, around us, and uh, <laughs> let's stop this thing. I went as far as the, the Elbe River. And uh, at that point, I still wasn't 19 years old. And we stopped at the Elbe. Uh, the war was over for us. Basically, the, the Russian was going to take Berlin, which was 50 miles in front of us. So I spent one day at the Elbe. And we found out that we had bypassed some Germans that were behind us, disrupting the, uh, our supplies and uh, doing some damage. So we were called back. Part of Combat Command B was sent back, 50 miles back. And we started to put up roadblocks. This was a, a forest area. And from what we were told, the Germans were in there, and uh, we would put up roadblocks. And we'd face north one. Two hours later, we'd be facing the east in the same town. <laughs> we went into a little town of Lindhoff. It wasn't a town, it was a village. It had nothing more than uh, maybe six or eight houses. Two squad of infantry, married infantry. And uh, our squad took a position on, uh, like, a, the letter A with the cross here. We were on the cross facing the top portion of the road coming in. They both joined. Back in. The other squad was at the, the point where they met. And uh, when it got dark, we hear the, the squeak of bogey wheels on tanks. And uh, it's, it's a very eerie sound. Uh, I was with Pat Flaherty. I was a rifle grenadier. I had uh, grenades that I fired from the rifle, anti tank, uh, white phosphorus, the likes of that. He was my ammunition carrier. We were out in the front hall. Our tank was behind us on our right, on our left. Uh, Two American half-tracks come on this road in front of us. We were maybe uh, from here across the street, 150 feet. And uh, our tank blows up, the one that's at the, the intersection. They were two American half-tracks that they had captured, but the rest was a one of so-and-so's armored division, a brand new one <laughs> that was bypassed and trying to make itself, make its way back to southern Germany to uh, get back with the forces. Uh, Pat and I were watching two Germans with a burp gun come along behind the houses and they were spraying the houses, uh, the two houses that were there, and we cleared a little bit of dirt, said let them get just a little bit closer as we didn't want the rifle flash to be seen. And we're watching them and letting them come, come, and all of a sudden those two guys were saved. Because behind us, from me to you, were four Germans. And they had spoken in German, and we heard them. They probably couldn't see the hole, but knew something was there, maybe saw some movement of us. And uh, we turned around, it was a slit trench, we turned around and all of us sat back against the dirt and we fired at them and uh, we got two of them. 
and two of them got us. They threw a potato mash. He was left-handed because he was silhouetted against the sky. I'll never forget that. He threw the grenade, and Pat and I were firing. He'd get up, I'd get up, and so on. And as I was coming down, and Pat was going up, they threw the grenade, they hit me on the leg, and bounced. And I yelled, grenade, and I reached for it. Why you reach for things, I don't know. But when Pat came down, the grenade was between Pat and the, the hole, the side of the hole that went off. Uh, it blew me halfway out of the hole. I lost my helmet, my hat, I mean my helmet and my rifle. And I was handed a carbine by the lieutenant at the tank. And he sent myself and another two guys down the road behind us to see that they, they didn't come around. I, uh, I get very emotional at this point, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, I didn't know if the carbine had one shell, was loaded, was empty, or anything else. I was loaded with M1 ammunition, two bandoliers, and the vest, and blanks for the grenades. Grenade launcher, how to use blanks. So you didn't mix this stuff up. Uh, we're in this ditch when off to our left, now we're facing the other way, comes another German tank. With that, our tank is backing up. They're getting out. So they back up and they're going to pull off down the road. And we get up out of the ditch and we're yelling because we figure, hey, <laughs> you guys on the tank, the lieutenant was hit, so he's on the back of the tank. Uh, they're going to shoot at anything that moves. Now here's three guys coming from the opposite direction. They didn't know we were there. The lieutenant did, but he's injured. Well, we finally called everybody's name and yelling that they stopped and picked the three of us up and we were evacuated with them. Uh, we lost uh, one tank, two half-tracks that night, uh, I guess ten men, of which uh, we got back one half-track later on because when we got to the town, the other, the other town, they set up the uh, artillery, which there was plenty around. It was behind the line, so there was numerous artillery out and they used the tank that was burning as a focal point and just bombarded the whole area. Uh, that's when the, the guys that were there that were captured actually took their own half-track back. Two guys walked back. So uh, we got most of them back except Pat. Pat in the hall with me. He was, uh, he was uh, in with the Germans, uh, he lived, Pat lived, right. Uh, they, the next day they sent the message that they had some uh, soldiers, uh, German and American, that were too badly wounded that their field uh, medics couldn't take care of them, and we stopped the war. We went in with, uh, with jeeps that had the color of the day on the hood, and uh, carried out the Germans and the Americans, one of which was Pat. Uh, that, that afternoon we were going back into the woods, of course you started the war again, <laughs> shut it off, started <laughs> on the games. Uh, we were dispersed in the woods and I was in the middle of the road with the rifle across my legs this way and just walking and uh, I was pulled out and sent to a to a hospital for a what they said was a mild concussion. But uh, I guess I was in La La Land. But uh, that was the end of the war for me. I uh, uh, I celebrated my 19th birthday in the hospital on April 27th, and the war was fini.
Finis la guerre. So, from there, I went to a replacement depot. Oh, no, no one was ever sent back to their outfit at that time because they didn't know what to do with the outfits at the end of the war to begin with. Well, I went to the military government, Angus. I ended up in, well, in Frankfurt where it was developed and went to Berlin as part of the military government. And uh, that's when you had generals galore, the British, the Russians. I saw a private get saluted by a two-star general. That there were so many that literally you were constantly this way and this kid, <laughs> he was a kid, I was a kid myself, walked past the general and the general in being so used to retaining a salute, saluted, and the kid went about four steps. Now I was back here. The general stopped, the kid stopped, and they both turned to look at each other to think. The kid said, probably said, I just missed saluting a general. <laughs> he saluted, the general turned as he walked by me, and I saluted. He was smiling to think, you know, <laughs> big joke of the day. Here I'm saluting a private. <laughs> I played football. With, uh, with the army. Uh, of course, at the end of the war, they had uh, a lot of things to do, so they had a football team. You played in uh, the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. I mean, equipment was fabulous. You know, that German masseuse would give you rub downs and that. And my mother passed away. And I went to the Red Cross. And uh, Red Cross was not very helpful. This is going on tape, so I don't want to say too much. <laughs> but uh, they would check on my father's health for me. That was it. Captain Snow of the uh, Adjutant General's office, which I had been assigned to before I played football, he got me home. He said, how many points do you have? And I told him, and he said, well, that's not enough to send you home. He said, uh, oh, let me go back a little bit. He asked me how many points I had. I said, well, when they figured it out, they told me I have X, but I really have Y. So he says, okay, we won't tell them. They gave me too few, the points were too low, very low. He says, I can send you home on a 30-day rest and recuperation fellow and you have to come back. Now they were doing that. He said, but when you get home, ask them to recheck your points and you'll have too many for them to send you back. He literally went down the list of people leaving in two days and crossed off a name and penciled my name in. I was home for Christmas the following year, so I spent just three days less than one year overseas. Uh, when I got home, I was in Fort Dix, I had a 30-day furlough. At the end of 30 days, I went back, and uh, when I reported in, I asked them to recheck my points, which they did, and the officer said, now, what do I do with you? He says, tell you what. Is a two-week furlough go home. <laughs> I had 30 days, <laughs> two weeks, <laughs> and I went back and I stayed in Fort Dix. I was in charge of the hotel in Fort Dix. The hotel was for troops coming in to be uh, signed out of the service. Uh, if they came in after 10 o'clock at night, they came to the hotel. We had sandwiches and coffee for them in a bed. Next morning they were up and they went to the separation center. So uh, what we had to do was make sure the beds were rolled back up and that somebody brought in the, the sandwiches and coffee at night in the, uh, the area. Uh, that was pretty good duty. I got, uh, I guess, chewed out once by a major uh, I wore a yellow <laughs> terry cloth robe to 
challenge in the morning because I'd be up half the night and go to the mess hall early in the morning, and it was sort of chilly, and I put this yellow terry cloth robe on, it was beach robe, like three quarters. And the major was coming out of the mess hall that morning, and he took one look at me and asked where he thought I, where I thought I was. <laughs> I never wore that again. <laughs> but uh, what I, happened to you after the war? Tell me about your life after the war. After the war, I, <clears throat> I guess I joined the fifty-two twenty club. You know, twenty dollars a week. You got fifty-two weeks. I think I was on that for like. 15 weeks, and uh, I went to work for Glidden Buick in Manhattan. My father worked for Glidden Buick, and Glidden in the city was a Buick dealer that owned seven dealerships in Brooklyn, three in Manhattan, and two in Jersey. Very big dealer. Since then, General Motors cut all of that out because it was a Monopoly. They named their own price. You couldn't go any place. The price was the same. Uh, I worked for my father. Was fired every day, once a day, because uh, if I didn't do it right, the German in him said, "You're out." And I'd wash up my hands, and he would say, "If you leave here, you're never coming back." So <laughs> I worked for Buick until General Motors busted up that dealership, and I went to work for Chevrolet as a mechanic. I was with Luby Chevrolet. Uh, you want me to go faster? <laughs> I, uh, Just hold a second. I uh, developed Luby Lee. To interview with Mr. Lawrence Steubing on 27 February 2001. We're talking about the car. Yes. Uh, Avis car leasing was buying parts of movie leasing. And Avis was situated in Plainview. And uh, part of my job was to turn over our records to Avis. And I was speaking to a, an Eddie Dame, who was the president of car leasing at the time. And uh, before I left his office, I was offered a job. So I resigned from movie leasing, and I went to Avis. Uh, I ended up retiring from Avis as director of their vehicle services throughout the country. I was the head mechanic, as I always like to say, of Avis car leasing. I had about 44,000 cars under uh, our jurisdiction that I had to keep rolling with numerous offices throughout the country. I became a very well-dressed mechanic. But, uh, <laughs> I could go California, Chicago, and Florida. When you got the job with Avis, that's when you moved to Long Island? Uh, no, I always lived on Long Island. Always did. When, uh, uh, when I got married, uh, I married a blind date in Brooklyn. And uh, after 54 years, I'm still with this blind date. And uh, we. We lived in Brooklyn one year and bought a home in the South Ozone Park. Uh, was, we were both 22 when we bought our first house. And uh, after a while, we came out to Bethpage where Tessie had her uh, three sisters lived in town, and we bought a home there. And uh, we raised five children there, uh, 13 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. So we're, we're a very tight-knit family to this day, even with the, the in-laws. We're, we're very close. So it's, uh, it was a good life. I enjoyed it. When did you move out to Beth Page? Oh, 19... <laughs> Been there 40-some odd years. Okay. <laughs> we'll go back. <laughs> don't ask me my children's birthdays. I don't remember that either. <laughs> Uh, we we love to travel. My wife and I, I, I have a 32-foot travel trailer. I retired from Avis in 1988, and uh, 15 days later, we hauled our trailer 
cross country and then parked it in Seattle and took a cruise up through uh, the inland waterways and then land up uh, by bus through the Yukon, train from through Denali Park and flew back and picked up our trailer. I was on the road for three months. Before, so. We enjoy that. To this day, I still have my trailer. And I have a big truck that I pull it with. Now, when you were putting together the book about your experiences in World War II for your children, things must have come to you. I mean, when you, after you got through doing the book, what, what jumped out at you and said, now, you know, what were the major themes? Or did you come to any conclusions after you finished the book? Any realizations? Well, not, not any conclusions. I was always very proud to this day. I am very proud of my heritage. I'm very, very proud of being in the service. As you see, I, I display my combat infantry, which is, to me, is the, the greatest. Uh, I have a bronze star, but this is still more meaningful to me than the bronze star. Uh, for whatever I did that night, maybe in that little town of Lindhoff, I don't know. But uh, this I know. Uh, uh, I speak in schools. I go to, I'm invited to numerous schools in Bethpage, mostly around Veterans Day. And uh, I go in with different things that I have, and not, not a gory thing to tell them about the war, but just, uh, uh, you know, I can go into a class with a 12-year-old kid and they not realize that, gee, I was only five years older than them when I went in service, you know, and various things. And I always wear sunglasses, and they, there was times a child would ask me, why do you wear sunglasses? And I'll say it's because of the emotional questions that you will ask me. And I don't want to see, have you see the tears in my eyes? And I do, because I, I get very emotional. And maybe that's good. I don't know. It's uh, so that you don't, you don't forget how bad things are. As I say, I'm a veteran of the uh, foreign wars. And I would love someday that there was never anyone available to belong to a veteran's foreign wars. Meaning no wars, you'd never have, you could always have the American Legion, but no more veterans in foreign wars. It's, uh, young people are too precious. Uh, as far as my book to remember, yes, there were, there were funny things that, uh, that come up that I would put down other things that I have forgotten. You know, uh, I'd have to go to the library to find out where I was. I literally have to go and read books, try and find out where was the Fifth Armored Division, you know, uh, uh, the likes of that. It's uh, uh, stories. Uh, I say Tony very good friend of mine, uh, we, were, we took a town once, uh, just a little story, and we had to go from house to house to see that it was clear. And we came to this house, the door was locked. So, again, like in the movies, you take the rifle, boom, 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 shoot the lock and kick the door open. Tony almost broke his foot. All you do is jam the lock. <laughs> it doesn't unlock. He kicked it. <laughs> We had to go round the back downstairs and in this back of this house, through the back door that we went through, in the corner was an elderly man and woman like me today, in the corner, so afraid that it was, it was ridiculous. Uh, we actually helped them up, put them on a chair on the table and got out. You know, to how you can inflict fear on the elderly, not knowing uh, they had no part of the war. Maybe they did, I don't know, but they weren't going to hurt me, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, as Paul says, said he has passed on this boy in Belgium, 
he said, memories are souvenirs. The only difference, what we do, we have souvenirs, we put them on the shelf. They're souvenirs, and the souvenirs that I have are up here. They're my memories. I enjoyed the service. I thought it was great. Uh, lost some good friends. Lost a lot of people I didn't know. I'm sorry for that. Other than that, I'm a very proud American. Good. Did you have any questions for me? How were you able to communicate with the tanks, the infantry? Did you? Oh, well, we were very close to them. We didn't want to get too far. Uh, the tank, the reason for infantry with the tank, you say, gee, a tank can take care of itself. A tank is blind. He is blind except here. Uh, we would stay behind him as much as possible, alongside him. But at night, you had to dig in around because that's when they were vulnerable. We had lost one with a uh, German infiltration that came right up behind it and hit it with a one of these pens, of course, disposable mm -hmm. uh, bazooka. Tony was next to it. He was blown head over heels. But uh, I don't know if you really talked. You know. did, were you using phones on the oh, back? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. We had nothing. Maybe somebody did. Maybe, uh, you know, the, the officers did. I'm sure they had radios in the tanks, but we didn't. You know, we would be in the half track, and when something would happen, we would dismount. The half track would stay there and we'd move up with the tank. Uh, you didn't want to stay too, too close to the tank because that's what they were going to shoot at to begin with. <laughs> the tank, when he exploded, you didn't want to be there. Uh, we had put up, at the end of one night, we had dug in around our tank, which was next to us, and did a half moon around both sides. And we saw this light way off in the distance that was just moving, bobbing along. And the tank crew now, the guy is up on top of the tank and he's saying to elevate the gun, bring it up higher so that uh, he's estimating the, the distance. And we're standing next to this wondering what this light is that's coming towards us. Until the gun crew says we can't elevate it any higher. This thing was up as high as it would go. Now this light that's coming down is all of a sudden almost next to us. It was an illusion at night of a man on a bicycle with a long pole and a flashlight on top. He was the Burgermeister of the town in front of us coming to tell us that the Germans had pulled out, please don't shell the town. But this thing coming down the road on the bicycle as he's riding, we're watching this, and we're looking and looking and thinking, what in God's name is this? Until it's right on top of us. Now, instead of looking up, we look down, there's the guy all dressed up, all dressed up with his uh, whatever he had on to show he was the man. <laughs> but funny things, dumb things. Yeah. Any other last thoughts? Last thoughts? No, it's a privilege and an honor to to be here today, and uh, well, I come. thank you for what you may put into the archives for, for God knows when. Long after I'm gone, maybe somebody will say to you, I knew a stooping. <laughs> well, actually, uh, it's not uh, too uncommon. We have a lot of stuff that was given to us by veterans in the Civil War, mm -hmm. World War I, mm -hmm. Spanish-American War. We get people calling us up saying, uh, you have something on my great-grandfather, and oh, see. sometimes we get lucky. We, we have a record or we have a photograph. Right. And uh, now, hopefully, we'll be able to also have these videos. Wonderful. In addition, we hope someday to put excerpts on the tape. Right. And then uh, uh, we'll be able to you know, distribute that to uh, schools and soldiers uh, training in units. Mm -hmm. I was just invited to another school this, uh, <coughs> at an affair over the weekend. The teacher her said to me that she heard I went to schools and spoke to the children. 
She says, I'd like to set it up for you to come to the school. Now, this is in towards the city. It's not even out here. Mm. No. Great. Uh, we enjoy doing that. Yeah, it's good stuff.